Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Sellers-Now, and I'm the Senior Advisor, and um, I lead JFF Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. <clears throat> I've spent a 40-year career, <clears throat> excuse me, in ex-offender re-entry work. Uh, I ran a local workforce board for about 10 years. I ran a state workforce board for about four years, did some policy work. I led the apprenticeship work at the Department of Labor during the previous administration. And now I'm at JFF where we're leading our office, uh, where we're leading our Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. Pleasure to join you today and a pleasure to have my, um, have all these great panelists here. Uh, really, you're going to see today, we're going to zoom all over the country <clears throat> and you're going to get which is endemic to youth apprenticeship, actually all apprenticeships, is you're gonna get a little bit of a different flavor from each perspective of the panel here, which is a good thing, um, because there is a great deal of flexibility in youth apprenticeship. Uh, but we know um, apprenticeship in general has a positive ROI, and Jonathan, who I was gonna give the hook to if he didn't leave, has just done some ROI work uh, recently for us on one of our programs and found a dollar forty-eight return on every dollar invested. Um, we know that the average age of apprentices in the U.S. is 28, 29, 30 years old. And in Europe, they're 17. And there is this growing and emerging, I call it a movement in youth apprenticeship. I mean, that's what attracted 300 of you to the call today. So there's great interest. We would not have had this conversation 10 years ago, eight years ago, probably even six years ago. Um, in the last hundred years of apprenticeship in this country, there's been a couple of attempts to really bring it down to youth. Um, and connect the earn and learn uh, model to youth, but hasn't been very successful until the last five years, and particularly with this effort by New America and uh, eight or nine great partners that they've involved. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna talk a little bit about the business perspective, the demand side, why it's important to them, why they got into it. And without further ado, I'm gonna get started. Uh, I'm joined today, let me just tell you who we have here. We have Kelly Flamia, who's Senior Manager at Accenture, we'll get back to Kelly in a minute. We have uh, David Trost, President and CEO of St. John's United in Montana. And I was just reading about St. John's this morning, very interesting organization. Uh, Pam Knapp is the Director of College and Career, Red Career Readiness at San Joaquin County Office of Education in Stockton, California. And then lastly, we're going to go down to Texas uh, to talk with Justin Yancey, who's with the Texas Business Leadership Council. So with that, let us get started. And we'll go, Kelly, I think we're gonna start with you first. Thanks so much for joining us today. I believe you're based in New York City, is that right? I am, I am. I'm based out of the uh, New York City office and actually live just a little bit south at the Jersey Shore. Oh, gee, tough break. Um, well, I'm at the Delaware Shore today, so I'll drive up to meet you. Um, so, so Kelly, thanks for making the time. Look, Accenture is a global company, uh, very well known in a lot of different pieces of work. Um, I know you've been with Accenture for 20 plus years and the whole change management experience. And, you know, you, you, I guess you, you look at organization according to your bio through global strategic changes and human resources. So, so apprenticeship happens all over the world, more so in the U.S. Accenture and every other business in this country was a little bit slow to the table the last hundred years. Um, so what was it that led to Accenture's interest in apprenticeship? I know you were doing some of that work in the Midwest and in Chicago, and now you're really taking the plunge into youth apprenticeship in New York. What was the story? What motivated you? And what are you all doing? Yeah, so I mean, our commitment to apprenticeship really starts at the top, right? So you'll hear our CEO, Julie Sweet, talking about the importance of apprenticeship. Um, our CHRO, Ellen Shook, talking about the importance of apprenticeship. And I think there's a really strong tie with Accenture's unwavering commitment to inclusion and diversity. And we look at apprenticeship as one of the ways that we can build a more inclusive and diverse pipeline. It also um, you know, really parlays well with our focus on skills as our common currency, right? So it's not always about the degree that you have, um, this concept of potential um, over pedigree. You know, really, we've really seen that come to life with, uh, with apprenticeship in North America and now specifically, as you've mentioned, in New York City with the launch of our first uh, youth apprenticeship program, uh, which continues to expand and now is also in Washington, D.C. That's great. So two really important things I'm going to pull from what you said. Skills yeah. are the currency in the workplace, maybe more so than a degree, uh, which Gosh, don't tell my mother that. She never would have uh, let me not go to college, right? Um, and the other is leadership matters, right? Your CEO, Julie, is out there, has been doing it for a year or two, did a great op-ed in the Post with 
with Greg from Aon about a year ago. Really outstanding to see big leaders uh, in the corporate world do that. So tell us about how you got connected uh, to um, CareerWise New York, which was also here to here, um, part mm -hmm. of the Pia Network. How did you, how did that connection happen? How long did it take you to get the religion of it and plunge right in there for this apprenticeship? And I believe you have 20 students involved right now. Is that right? Um, so our number has grown. Our inaugural launch, Cohort 1, uh, we refer to them affectionately as the Terrific 20. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that cohort launched last September. And then we just welcomed last Monday um, Cohort 2, which is our other Terrific 20, um, in addition to four apprentices in Washington, D.C. So our numbers continue to grow. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. And, and how did that connection happen? Did you go to them, they come to you, or you at a networking event? How do these things happen at the corporate level? Because that's yeah. a real challenge for everybody listening in today. How do I get a great employer like Kelly in my neighborhood? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so our connection happened, I would say, you know, very naturally with our CHRO, Ellen Shook, um, sitting on the business council um, for, for Here to Hear, and with them serving as kind of the, the incubating organization for CareerWise. Um, Accenture was, you know, one of the first at the table to make the commitment um, to launching um, and being one of the pioneers as part of the um, launch of this first modern youth apprenticeship here in New York City with our commitment of 20 apprentices. Um, so with that and in partnership with, with CareerWise, we then look to say, okay, how, what's this program gonna look like, right? Acknowledging that our program, which is a three-year journey and targets um, high school juniors, so 16 year olds, that even though we have a number of different apprenticeships across North America, that there definitely were some unique nuances when you look at this particular youth apprenticeship audience. So we pulled together um, a small team that was just very passionate about this work and, and looking at you know, how we create this, this pathway here at Accenture and how do we make this experience unique? I mean, that really was key, right? It wasn't just something we could take off the shelf. We had great starting point um, you know, from our different programs, but there was a, a heavy degree of customization to really make sure that we were creating the right experience for our apprentices. And that started with looking at the types of roles that we were going to target. And so the roles um, that we targeted for our cohort one were across marketing, um, mm -hmm. all different facets of uh, human resources, as well as our local technology support. Wow, very interesting. So that's great. So you're using, it sounds like you're using the CareerWise model and CareerWise Colorado works with multiple sites across the country trying, trying to spread the, the love of their model, mm -hmm. which works very well and spread it to New York and organized all these partners. So just real quickly before we have to leave you uh, yeah. and we'll come back of course, but could you talk a little bit about the program structure uh, when they're juniors and seniors, how many hours a week are they working? What are they getting paid? What credentials do they get along the way? And what happens after they get out of high school? Yes, absolutely. So again, three-year journey. So they're coming to us uh, high school juniors and they work 16 hours per week mm -hmm. and that's in compliance with local labor laws. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that that pans out during the week is Monday through Thursday, um, cohort one, and this I'm gonna kind of quote pre-COVID, um, cohort one was working one to 5 p.m. Monday through mm -hmm. Thursday. So they would go to school in the morning they would have what I refer to as an adult commute in, as most of our students are um, coming from New York City public schools in either the Bronx um, or Brooklyn. So about an hour-ish commute into the office, work from one to five, then head back home. Um, this is an earn uh, while you learn model. Mm -hmm. So they, they, you know, they are um, earning a, a marketed competitive wage. And as employees, they are also entitled to benefits. So they have the option to opt in for medical, for dental, for 401k, which surprisingly we have a few of our apprentices, right? We're very uh, keen on finance that have opted in for their 401k as well as, you know, having the ability to participate in our employee stock purchase plan. That's great. And just before yeah. I leave you, there was one other thing. Well, there's two things. Yeah, you know, you, you spoke about Accenture's interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. And, and companies get in this for various reasons. Right. Some are concerned about their skills level, about their next generation of workers. Some are saying we need to, to diversify more. Was it all of those things? What really drove you to the table? What was the pressing need that drove you to the table as an employer? Yeah. So I would say um, for Accenture, I would clarify and say it's not an interest in inclusion and diversity, that it is a, is a true commitment. 
-hmm. And so again, you know, bringing in um, and ensuring that we have a diversity, you know, of thought and diversity across all of the different dimensions is really what we believe fuels innovation. And we are a company known for innovation. And so we need to have, you know, a diverse group represented um, at the table in terms of, you know, what our clients need, what we need. Right. And so that's, you know, that's definitely a, a key driver. Yeah, and that's a really important point um, for companies that are committed and that a lot of companies are, but they're trying to solve several problems, whether it's or challenges reflect the communities they serve in or find a pipeline of workers for tomorrow or, you know, build our own workforce. So that's great. One last question. I promise this is really it. No has, COVID, has COVID slowed you down? It has not slowed us down. Um, it definitely has required us to pivot. Um, so in March, you know, as, a, as everyone knows, but certainly in New York City being hit, you know, quite hard with COVID, um, we, our, our program was impacted. And so we were what we were calling on a pause, right? So the, the DOE um, had, um, as schools, New York City schools shut down, and as they started to bring the students back, um, internships and apprenticeships were, were actually on pause for quite some time, so about mm -hmm. the mid-March time frame, and then they weren't reinstated um, until early May. So during that time, um, you know, our program was still moving, I would say, full steam ahead from a, from a core team perspective, so from the individuals that support all of our apprentices to make sure that we could, you know, one, continue to support the apprentices, um, you know, checking in with them, right, their emotional um, uh, kind of status and, and how they were doing, right, so really leading from the front with compassion, that was our, really, the, the top of the priority, but then it was taking a look at how is this program now going to look in a, in a COVID world where we aren't going to see them in the office? None of us are in the office right. every day anymore. Um, so, so what does that look like? And that hmm. was everything from how do we, you know, get their PCs shipped out to them so that they are technologically enabled, ensuring that everyone can connect um, and perform their jobs in a digital way. It was looking at our curriculum with a slightly different lens. Um, so we are very focused on, you know, building competencies and in these early months, very focused on building what we were calling power skills. So those skills that everybody needs, those foundational skills to be successful. Mm -hmm. Well, now that took on a slightly different lens as you start to focus on trying to enable these students who are now juggling school in a virtual environment plus work in 100% in the virtual environment. You know, what does it look like to now focus on pulling in um, digital working? into the curriculum, uh, a focus on uh, mental health and resiliency. So do we slow, I, I, so that's why I say I don't think we slow down because we really used that time when the programs themselves were on pause mm -hmm. to check in and make sure that our apprentices were okay and had what they needed. And then to make sure that as soon as the DOE gave us the green light um, and that the programs could be reinstated, that we were ready to hit the ground running um, in a slightly different way, but still effective to um, really bring to life their experience, which was initially so immersive and now had flipped to digital, I say overnight, but we had a few weeks there to replan. Well, that, that's an interesting pivot. And I'm sure you had to work very closely with your partners to do that. It sounds like you've successfully adopted and pivoted to both your advantage and the advantage of the students. Um, all right, Kelly Flamia from Accenture, stand by. We're gonna go down the list a little bit, maybe get you back for some questions. Uh, David Trost is the president and CEO of St. John's United in the great state of Montana. And I've read up a little bit on St. John's United as a, a really high quality human service agency that has a pretty wide uh, connection there um, uh, across uh, Montana. So uh, David, welcome very much. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing on apprenticeship. Well, tell us a little bit more about, um, about uh, St. John's United and what you, how you got into apprenticeship. Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. Um, St. John's United is a human service organization providing services throughout the arc of life from birth to death. Uh, we provide adoption services, birth parent counseling, mental health, um, child care, and then provide housing and services for, for teens. Um, a big part of our workforce is nurses and certified nursing assistants. And I think everyone's well aware that those are two really um, um, uh, workforce shortage areas, uh, CNAs and mm -hmm. uh, nursing. 
and it is our issue at St. John's as well. At any one time, we'll have like 60 positions open out of a workforce of 700. Um, we're a nonprofit organization as well, owned by uh, local Lutheran churches here in um, Montana. And so, um, you know, resources aren't a plethora. Um, I, you know, I, I know that my friend Kelly over at Accenture, they got, they've got some deep pockets and can make things happen maybe like this a little bit better. At St. John's, we, um, we struggle to, to do things like this, but having those 60 openings made us um, have to get really creative. And so one of the things we talked about was, can we create our own nursing school? And as we started to look down that path, uh, St. John's nursing um, uh, program in terms of a nursing school was gonna be impossible based on the regulatory requirements to start a school. So then we said we would uh, maybe partner with some schools to try to train students and uh, figure out that. I've been a part of um, orientation for nursing students uh, over the last 25 years. And every time I uh, talk to a new nursing class, one of the things I ask them is, will you graduate with college debt? And most of them will say yes. And I often respond with a simple question of why? Because every hospital in this country, most nursing homes in this country uh, will probably reimburse them for every penny of their college debt just to get them to work there at their places. And this is what I have been told by almost 90 to 100 percent of those students. We don't want to make that commitment. They are too early in it. So the way we modeled our apprenticeship program or our program, uh, what we called originally a nursing fellowship program, is that we were going to recruit juniors and high school students, junior and seniors in high school, to engage in our nursing fellowship program, which was going to be a, a work in, in pre-terminal degree positions, like being a aide or being a certified nursing assistant, or then being an LPN, and then being a registered nurse, so some kind of a progressive model. And while you were doing that, we would pay for your education. And when you graduated, here was the magic bullet and what we thought would be successful. They didn't have to continue to work for us. They did all their service pre-degree, not post-degree. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, the model that we were looking to do. And so as we were working with the local high school, as we were working with the local colleges, as uh, we were working with our local workforce development group, um, the folks at the Montana Youth Apprenticeship Program had heard what we were doing and asked us to take a leadership role in becoming the first registered nursing apprenticeship program in the Northwest. And so, um, so our program now fully registered as a nursing apprenticeship program. It's hard to do nursing apprenticeships just yeah. because um, of the, the well, we like the skills-based learning, the, we talked about the terminal degree, Kelly talked about, you know, over-educated, uh, under-skilled. I mean, in this case, to get a nursing degree, you have to go to college. And so it's not something, so in college isn't necessarily the equal ter um, term with apprentice. And so it had to include the apprenticeship concept, but also require them to go and get a formal education. And there is no shortcuts, unfortunately, around nursing education, you have to do 100% of that programming regardless. So, so, Dan, so why didn't you, I'm sorry, sorry for stepping in, but um, so what made you decide to lean towards youth instead of saying, you know what, we're going to work with Minsku and our community colleges and we'll get nurses right out of there. You chose very specifically to lean in towards youth. So yeah. why was that? It was really all about um, programming, getting, um, one was competitive, trying to get a, a, to, to get um, students to think about our place of business early, uh, get them uh, tied in, show them that we care, fund their education, prove that we're funding their education, and then also proving that, hey, when you're done, you have no more ties to us and go become a pediatric nurse or become a ICU nurse or whatever. 
but their nursing program they do at St. John's will be mostly centered around geriatrics. And, um, and so um, it, it was a means to an end for many of them or will be a means to an end. Also parents love it. Mm -hmm. uh, St. John's United has a fairly solid reputation in our community and I think um, parents aren't opposed to having their kids work at St. John's United. Mm -hmm. And if they're gonna be nurses, the only way to get into nursing school these days is to do CNA work before you apply because it's almost a prerequisite now to be, mm -hmm. become a certified nursing assistant before you can become get into nursing school. It's so competitive to get yep. into those spots. And how so many schools, uh, how many high schools are you connected with now where you recruit students? Uh, we're connected with any high school student that will um, that will commute or live in Billings to do this program. So we have about five, six high schools in our in the kind of the, the general metropolitan area. Uh, we work with one joint school that is sponsored by all the three high schools in, in Billings. They mm -hmm. all have a career center or a, you know a, um, um, a you guys know this stuff better than I do the um, uh, career and educational techni technical um, program. Career and technical education program. And so they share in the infrastructure of the fourth high school that does just that. And that's where right. we get most of our students from. All right. And then we offer so, it also to teach. We're also the faculty member at that high school teaching CNA classes in the school setting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's very, very integrated system. Yeah. So Accenture, Kelly and Accenture um, chose just to do a, a non-registered, a high quality non-registered program and um, have a model with the partners that they have. You chose to do register. Um, you probably didn't even know what a registered apprenticeship was until uh, Minnesota, until Montana reached out to you. But nope. tell us how that came about and what support did you get from the state of Montana people? Yeah, when they reached out, uh, one, it gave us credibility. Oh, first of all, if we're gonna try to say we have a nursing program, by being a registered apprenticeship program in nursing, that gave us some credibility and that was helpful. Two is, I mean, nonprofit, we hear the word money and grants and support, we're, we're all over it. And so um, becoming registered and working with the state of Montana, it gave us a new uh, window of access to grants and to support for things like that. Uh, this program has become uh, pretty, pretty, um, uh, pretty easy to raise money for mm -hmm. and so we have uh, found a donor who had um, basically funded a significant portion of this program to endow it so we have enough money in the endowment to hire a a registered nurse mentor or an advisor that the colleges don't have to replicate and they're on site and they are counseling and coaching and helping our apprenticeships work and learn in this environment mm -hmm. and that's a mm -hmm. full-time paid position and if it wasn't for this um, endowment we would not be able to afford that right and right. Um, that's a significant part of the success right and that's that support all the way around on so many different issues i'm sure that they deal with there um so has uh well two quick questions one is um, for the on-the-job learning part, are they working in your facilities um, yeah. when they practice? Or are they going to other hospitals and facilities to do no, that? They have to work in our facility unless it's part of a clinical portion um, that they need like an ER mm -hmm. rotation or a, a pediatric rotation, then they'll go and do those things. Those won't be paid experiences, but those are part of the general academic Practical. portion. Right. There are hours that they work here when they're a CNA, they get paid like a CNA as well as they get uh, tuition reimbursement credits. So if they work just part-time here and work consistently, there'll be enough tuition reimbursement credits to pay for their entire tuition. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then um, those credits, any unused credits can be used to advance their degree to the next level, as long as they continue to work for us. At any time they have a terminal uh, a degree that they're done achieving, like if they just want to become an LPN, they can stop in the apprenticeship program, apply for a regular full-time position here, or go somewhere else. But if they want to continue, they get to still stay in the program, they get to have the reduced hour requirement, and they can go on to their next level of nursing. 
we will do this all the way through uh, a master's degree if they want. That, uh, and we see examples like that all over the country where uh, they will complete an apprenticeship. The employer will gladly advance them uh, tuition reimbursements to go to their bachelor's degree or whatever. Um, so that is an interesting model that you say, look, you graduate, go wherever you want, you know, we, and, and, you know, we know that job retention is at 94% with most apprentices. So I would imagine many of them out of their investment in you and your investment with them will hopefully stay with you. If we're successful, we will train more nurses than we need. And so mm -hmm. many of them will have to go elsewhere. Okay. Um, Which is good so, for the industry and good for the state. Yeah. And good for our CD positions that are, so if they all serve as CNAs while they're going to school, it's filling yeah. our CNA positions, which are even harder to find for us. Than That's great. Tough experience to get. Last question quickly. Um, COVID, did COVID slow you down? How have you coped or adapted with that? Yeah, COVID has not um, slowed us down. It might have slowed students down. It mm -hmm. might have slowed some other things. But the, but for me, we've had a, our philosophy here has been that, um, there is no better time to learn about healthcare than right now during the pandemic. And so most of the healthcare centers across the country, most of them here in Billings have said, hey, let's slow down students. I mean, we don't wanna be responsible for them during this pandemic. I've taken the complete opposite track that if nursing folks who are in health, any level of healthcare education are not in healthcare right now, they are missing it incredible experience. Uh, one good example, we have, um, in, we have a inter internship, um, a 12 month um, residency program or internship program for administrators. And all the administrative internships across the country had, had pretty much gone to zero. Um, but the intern we had pre-COVID recruited, we said, come out as early as you can. If the school college shut down early for her, we said, come out because you have nothing else to do. There's not better, there's no better time to be educated than today. All right, David, great. Thank you very much. Montana's doing some really cool things with apprenticeship and now youth apprenticeship. And I know the state of Montana has been working on this for a while. So great to see, um, see you all doing that at uh, St. Joseph's. So we're gonna fly. So David, thank you, stick around for a minute. Uh, I'm gonna be running tight on questions at the end, but I wanna hear from the rest of our folks, of course. So. Um, let's fly over to California and meet with our good friend, Pam Knapp, who had me laughing on the phone the other day because she's pretty direct and we love that. Uh, Pam is the Director of College and Career Readiness at San Joaquin County Office of Education in Stockton. And she has worked with a range of partners to create something called ARCH, which I'll let her explain, um, and develop some really interesting apprenticeship work going on through the California Community College Chancellor's Office Grant Program. Pam, welcome. Uh, Welcome. I guess it's the morning where you are. Um, yes. Thank you, Eric. It's nice okay. to be here. All right. So tell us a little bit. You were talking the other day on the phone, which I found interesting, as to how you stumbled all over this apprenticeship stuff and forged a partnership with a lot of really key people on the ground that I think folks on the line would be interested in. So tell us a little bit about how all that came together and how you supported it. Well, certainly. So in 2018, a large group of people in San Joaquin County, which is in, in Stockton, actually, came together. Um, it was initiated by our local workforce investment board, and they brought together people from education, county and governmental jobs and industry to form the subcommittee they called the San Joaquin County High School, Init High School Apprenticeship Initiative Program. And so I came into that subcommittee in July of 2019, so one year later. So they had been forging this work with uh, a champion at one of our small school districts called Ripon Unified School District because throughout our county, we have a lack of professionals in IT, information technology, and specifically at our school districts. And as you know, all of the districts across the nation are rolling out a one-to-one -one device for all of our students, and that's especially relevant now through COVID. And so we had been rolling out one-to-one -one devices in California, and they were being in need of service. And so the small school districts couldn't keep up with the demand. And so one of our district superintendents said at this apprenticeship, high school apprenticeship subcommittee meeting, we need to grow our own we need to get a high school apprenticeship program started in IT so that we can train our own students to work within our school district IT program 
and help with the needs that are out there. And so that had been going on for a year and I entered the committee in 2019 in my new position at San Joaquin County Office of Ed after spending the past 25 years working as a high school counselor doing career tech ed and college and career readiness. And I worked at a private college in career placement. So I have a background in CTE and my passion is working with students and seeing them progress through their goals after high school. And so apprenticeship is the perfect marriage of career tech ed. And it's the ultimate cherry on that Sunday because here these students are earning and learning and working all the way through to get that ultimate career. And so when I joined the committee, it was um, serendipitous that at the same time, the California Community College Chancellor's Office had released an RFA for what's known as the California Apprenticeship Initiative Grant. And so I was charged with the task to lead the grant writing on that with several partners. And so we wrote this grant and submitted it in the end of September. And we learned that we were funded for $500,000 through the chancellor's office. But the caveat to that is it's a three-year grant program and we need to, we agreed to register 25 high school students with the Division of Apprenticeship Standards in those three years. Mm -hmm. So that was daunting for me coming into this new program. Sure. Really, uh, not sure how to make that happen. So here we are a year later and we are moving forward. So you found young people and students in school to work um, to work in the IT division to help repair the equipment because your growth in equipment due to COVID and everything else, technology is taking over, right? So, um, but you did, had some interesting partnerships along the way. You got together uh, what, you know, with your workforce board and um, what another college, and then you had to uh, work with representatives from Division of Apprenticeship Standards, I guess. So talk a little bit about your partners and what role the workforce board is playing. Absolutely. And they were invaluable, clearly, to this because, again, I came into something new and mm -hmm. I could spell the word apprenticeship. And so my, my <laughs> year of training with all of these folks has just been amazing. And uh, so definitely our Workforce Investment Board in San Joaquin County is known as WorkNet. Mm -hmm. And the executive director there led this charge to start the subcommittee. And it was really in as an answer to Governor Newsom's uh, directive that by the year 2029, he wants to see 500,000 apprentices in the state of California. And so this uh, high school apprenticeship subcommittee thought, well, why not tap into the youth and let's bring them on and let's register them. So within the subcommittee um, in WorkNet, our local workforce investment board was uh, the president of our local community college, San Joaquin Delta College, and the uh, career tech ed dean, uh, among others, and then many superintendents from within the school districts in San Joaquin County, and then me and other representatives from our County Office of Education. So along all of us together put together this grant, and uh, we were connected to PIA, and PIA agreed to support us with a letter of support, which was greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. And we connected with the Division of Apprenticeship Standards and um, our particular representative, I'm like, I'm on a phone call a day with this person trying to make sure we cover everything we need. And so yes, it is a, is a definite collaborative. And I'm going to guess the term registered apprenticeship is something you didn't even know two years ago. Is that right? Mm -mm. I'm, I'm, I'm betting most of you on the panel probably didn't know what that was until recently, right? Um, and did you know that you didn't have to register your program or were you just said I had to register it? Um, as part of the grant requirements, we have to register. Yes, yeah, that's right. And that's so, right. and also in order to meet that 500,000 goal, they need to be uh, registered with the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. That's, that's perfect. And there are a lot of grant programs, which is why some register both with the Department of Labor and in their states because it opens up the ability to apply for economic development funds or like the community college grant program or, or state apprenticeship funds. So that dual, um, dual registration uh, doesn't have to be difficult. Some places it is, but it certainly opens it up to state funding as well as federal funding. So that's great. Um, so what lessons learned? I mean, where do you think these students will go from here? I mean, some, a critic would say, well, great, they're working for the school system, but what about getting a real job? These are real jobs, are they not? Absolutely, they're real mm -hmm. jobs. And so I think that the main thing that I want to stress is 
we started with what I want to call as a low hanging fruit, obviously. Our IT departments had a need and we have a need in San Joaquin County to train more people in IT. And so the earning, as you learn, the students are going to get this hands-on training starting as soon as they can get back into school districts. Mm -hmm. So right now, all of our districts are still learning remotely. And uh, we did move into the red tier in San Joaquin County. So we're hoping that they will start to go back into the schools. And I'm hoping the OJT portion of this will start. Um, I'm really excited to report that we have six students who started their classes on Monday at San Joaquin Delta College. So they're taking what's known as Computer Science 11. And this is also serving the need of dual enrollment. And so these high school students are now duly enrolled with our local community college, earning their college credits. And it's going to be a three-year pathway. So the students will ideally start as juniors, 16-year-olds, and take a class a semester and then over the summer and then finish off the required um, work processes that uh, are the RSI, the latest supplemental instructive courses that our committee put together that they wanted. And so they're all in. They started Monday and they're all doing well so far. That's great. That's great. Um, Pam, it's such a great, you know, more and more community colleges are getting into this space more and more are partnering with workforce boards, although that's not always the case around the country. Um, so it's nice to see these partnerships come together and then uh, you working with the state and getting that grant. I think that was a really wise move. In the interest of time, I wanna go on a little bit um, uh, to Justin Yancey in the great state of Texas. So stand by everyone. I will say, please check the chat. There's a couple of questions in chat, a couple of links about nursing apprenticeships and some other information in chat to look with. Um, uh, Justin Yancey, thanks for joining us from the great state of Texas. Uh, as I scroll for way too many open windows on my uh, machine here, uh, uh, you're with the Texas Business Leadership Council and you've been around business organizations, business advocacy groups for many, many years. Um, guys like you are people I used to chase after when I worked at the state government and local government to, uh, to get business leaders who could be real advocates and cheerleaders for things that work. Um, but Justin, how did you get connected in Texas to this apprenticeship movement? Again, um, fairly new, probably in your world of, of business roundtable and business leadership councils. Uh, how did it come to you and what role have you been playing? Uh, thanks, Eric. That's right. It's new, but we're very excited to be in involved in this. Uh, the Business Leadership Council has, has, is, a market, is a membership based organization. And, and so a couple of our things that are constant with our, with our members are, the, you know, one, they don't have a lot of time and on their schedules, no one really does. But two, is that they were all having talent pipeline challenges. And so over the years, we worked with things that are a little bit more clunky in terms of not being able to connect really well with community colleges or school or K-12 and, and things. And so um, we've, we've have a background of working in education and workforce. Our members know that we need uh, because they're they're seeing firsthand that they're they don't have the the talent to be able to grow and expand when 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 they want to. So we've been working on this for years. Um, the state has a goal of uh, having 60% of our 25 to 34 year olds to have some level of post secondary success. And uh, right now in Texas, um, we're at about 44% of the of, of that with 10 years to go to to reach a goal that really has now even increased around the country from 60 to 65, 70%. And, and we're showing that 71% of jobs in Texas by 2036 will require some level of post-secondary success. And currently about a third of our Texas high school students, six years after high school graduation have, have some level of success. So we, all of that together has made our member, has brought our members together and realizing this is something that uh, we really have to work on education workforce. So when, when Educate Texas brought to us, uh, Educate Texas is a, a great collaboration partnership mm -hmm. uh, it, based in uh, both Dallas and in Austin, brought to this idea to us oh, just a little over a year ago, I guess. Um, we were very interested. Um, we spent some time with uh, in Denver with CareerWise and, and Educate Texas and have been working on this. And so we've realized that um, for the first time, it, it's an employer-led, an employer-driven mechanics. Mm -hmm. And um, while that adds to what Brent said is not being easy, trying to get you know, the business partners to engage, when they understand what it is, it's actually we've built a lot of momentum very early on. 
Um, but that that that's a key element for us. And again, everyone, I'm the only one on this panel who's who's in a, the earlier stages. Uh, we don't have an actual you know programs going on yet. There are some very similar things, but not not what we call youth apprenticeship. And so uh, having having that ability for a business to say. Uh, this is what we need. We can bring in a you know a, a junior and senior in high school, be able to teach them, work with them directly is is just going to be um, uh, very helpful. And they get that. Um, some of the again, some of the older models were, do you need help with your workforce? Yes. Well, what curriculum do you need, and what curriculum do you need in ten years? And right. you know, it, and it's really hard for our leaders and our CEOs and senior executives to be able to do that uh, with everything that's going on. So this is a real time work in partnership with the school and community college and, and we're very interested and again I um, want to thank you know Paya New America uh, of course Educate Texas JFF and, and we have a company in Texas Texas Mutual that's supporting this work and an early champion of the work so we're very happy to Texas Mutual Insurance and we're very happy to, to have them. That's great um, so you know you have an interesting role and um, you know you're <laughs> Uh, Kelly earlier said skills is a currency and to us practitioners, employers are currency, right? You're very valuable to people in the system. And the biggest question I get when we work with community colleges or workforce boards or nonprofits is, gee, how do you engage with employers? It's really, really hard. Um, but here we have an employer group who's really trying to lead. Are you more of an advocate for the youth apprenticeship or recruiter or a policy advocate, a cheerleader? What exact, how does your organization sort of support it? Uh, yes, 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 and yes. So far. Okay, that's and, what I figured. I will say though that, that you know the heavy lifting has really educate Texas is is the key mm -hmm. key partner here, uh, as well. And well, with, with with Brent New America with, with CareerWise, we've had so much help and there's been so much support, and that's why we've gotten this far so so fast. But but yeah, the, the business leadership council, uh, we realize it can't just be within our members. We're a small by design CEO senior executive organization, um, but we have you know, other contacts, other business associations, organizations, and regional groups. And so we're, ours, uh, our main purpose is to uh, bring in the business partners, mm -hmm. help with some of the legislative uh, pieces that will be needed in our, in our, our, uh, our state legislature uh, when it convenes next, next year. Um, all of those different things. Uh, but yeah, we're, we hope to be a, a, a we, we feel like we are a cheerleader for it as well. And uh, Texas being such a big state that, you know, the regional approach we can talk about later if you want or, or not, but we've, you know, Houston and El Paso and Austin are very different, distinct, you know, cities. And so we really want to build a program that uh, where we don't go into a place and say, we're here to solve your problems. But again, this is the, the beauty of this. This is that we can work with uh, chambers, work, work, mm -hmm. workforce boards and intermediaries um, to build on what they're already doing and, and then put this system though in place uh, with businesses that are excited. So really across the board right now we're we're to sort of figure out all we're, what we are but we're just excited to be part of it yeah and if if a group of practitioners or stakeholders and hang on there joyce i'll be wrapping up shortly um if a group of stakeholders um came to you and said boy we're really getting hung up by this uh this law the problem in the law about i'll make one up under 18 year olds working in in the workplace uh, and there was a bill floating around. Is that something you guys might get behind uh, to support sure. a print? Sure, we, we're very active. Our legislature uh, meets 100, uh, 140 days every two years, even though you'll still see a bumper sticker every once in a while. You're sure they didn't mean two days every 140 years, but with, as it's a very part-time legislature, we don't meet a lot. Uh, they don't meet a lot. And so we're basically working year round to prepare for the next session, which starts in January with, under the umbrella of, of you know the, the pandemic and not knowing if we'll be able to get into the capital or not but yes we'll be pushing uh, you know for some uh, clarification working with the texas workforce commission uh and and we we work with the uh, there's a dropout recovery school hopefully they're watching uh that um at texas can academy that, that we'll be hopefully supporting them in some legislation that they need for their students to be able to participate a variety of things but really everything is to drive system alignment that's the key that we're working on, but we will, yes, have a have a have a, a role in the next legislative session. Okay, great. Um, I, I do want to get to any anything else that I'm missing that you would do want to say, Justin. I do want to sort of wrap it up and open it up for a question before I do wrap up. And anything else about the Business Leadership Council 
I mean, it's such a great example of these partnerships at a much different level at the state, you know, Educate Texas, Business Leadership Council, others coming together to support this. Any, anything else we should know about uh, your work? Well, I know we're a little late, but briefly, I'll just say that our, our businesses in Texas, what we're fortunate enough to have had a very strong economy before COVID and, you know, things are really coming along quickly um, as we, we start to um, rebound. And so our, uh, it's just the tried and true or the, the reality is that this program is, is going to be strong uh, in, in any kind of economy. And so, uh, yeah, we're just, we're happy to, to see how this plays out with that overlay of, of coming out of a, of a tough economic time. Great. Well, I think JFF is also working in Texas, so we hope to, to see they you are. around there as well. Uh, I know we have to wrap up, and if I can have the indulgence of New America just for a minute. There's a lot of questions in the chat. A lot of people want to be in touch with you, Kelly and Pam and David and all of you. So, you know, I'll let folks follow up with you. Um, and, and there's a lot of interest in the uh, over-educated but under-skilled question. But for each one of you, I think it would be really helpful what is one tip you would have for a fledgling program on how to engage with employers, right? That seems to be the holy grail in this business. Um, you're on the other side of that, but people want to know, you know, what's the best way for me to involve and get engaged with business so I can get them to take apprentices. Uh, Justin, I'm going to start with you first. I'm going to go over to Kelly. I think just making it, uh, I mean, obviously I'm the opposite. I'm the other side, <laughs> right. the other side of that, but I think they're just, the reality of, of, of making something that can work and that makes sense and that can be done like this, where it's not uh, just a, a conversation with big ideas that don't, this is very nuts and bolts. This is how it works. Thank goodness for CareerWise and, and other, other, other groups around the country that have, have led to, to this, provided some of some blueprints for us, but uh, businesses get it. And so I'm looking forward to hearing what the others have to say, but no, I mean, I think the fact that it's just very, to find definitive yet yet mm -hmm. customizable that if right. it wasn't customizable we wouldn't have any uh, right. near as much interest so so be clear nuts and bolts it's practical project communicate that kelly what advice do you have for practitioners practitioners and stakeholders yeah absolutely so i i mean i echo justin's comments around the flexibility piece i mean we've as an example, right, with our different roles, with marketing, with human resources, we now have folks working in our innovation hub. I think it's really important as you engage employers to give them that flexibility as they start to think about the different ways in which mm -hmm. a youth apprenticeship might be able to come to life within their own company. The other piece that I think is really important when you think about the pitch when you're talking to these companies is, is being able to get them over that hump or that roadblock of the fact that these youth apprentices are often 16 years old. Mm -hmm. That really can sometimes be a stumbling block. Um, and so I think one of the ways that you can do that is being able to articulate with examples from other employers of you know the different successes and type of work and value that these apprentices bring through the programs. You know, these are not make-believe projects. They, our apprentices are working on real work, real projects. I think when you're able to, to articulate that, that that really helps to get them over the fact that you'd be bringing someone that's 16 years old into your, into your office, into your workforce. Right. These folks are not getting coffee and copying. Right? No, uh, no. I mean, they're re yeah. so if I use local technology <laughs> support, they are re-imaging computers, right? right. And, and handling all of our different tech issues. Yeah. Oh, wow, it's fabulous. That's great. Thank you, Kelly. David, um, so what's your tip for stakeholders or partners out there in the community to, or parents for that matter, to engage in a youth apprenticeship program? Sure, Eric. You know, for those that are trying to help get, convince businesses to do this, I think you need to see, it needs to be approached from a mathematical problem. There just isn't enough human beings to serve all the um, workforce needs in our, in our country. Uh, pre-COVID and even after COVID with so many folks not wanting uh, to engage at this time, that's that's hard. So what I think an apprenticeship does is, especially youth apprenticeship, it increases the numbers of potential workers. Mm -hmm. And so that is a reason for doing it. I mean, just stealing your neighbor's worker to replace your worker for them to steal them back is not gonna solve the problem. So we need to find a new source of human beings and younger people are part of that new source. The other source is college students. While they're in college for four years in a traditional programming, they are out of the workforce. So 
if you can get them out of a college setting for two, one or two less years by doing an apprenticeship, that brings additional mathematical human beings to the workforce. And so with so many people retiring these days, I think that's um, uh, a reason why we have to support apprenticeships. Okay, great, great tips, great pitches. And I know in the healthcare industry, when I was doing sector work there, there was so much cannibalism. The facility a mile down the road offered $2 an hour more and people would just go back and forth. So this is a way to bring people together and uh, serve the industry. Thanks, David. So Pam Knapp, let's go out to California. Um, you, uh, you're not an employer, but you were part and partial of the development of this. How do you get, uh, well, your employers were online. What, what do you do with the next step? How do you encourage employers to participate? Even your school system uh, leaders. <laughs> That's the million dollar question, Eric, and I'm hoping seriously that with these first cohort of six amazing students, we're going to be able to, for lack of better words, show them off to everybody in our mm -hmm. county and say, look what we're doing. And this is what is needed. And it's the same thing. Everybody who gets trained, not everybody, but I mean, so many people who get trained in IT in our community go over the hill into the Bay Area because the pay is so much higher and the commute is there and that's what happens. We need to keep these folks here in our community and that's exactly what we're doing. And so I think one of the things I, I've been harping on when I do my pitch is, did you have a job when you were 16? That's what I say to employers mm -hmm. because this is more than a job and there's nothing wrong with a job, but this is a career and this is going to lead to something students can stay engaged in for a lifetime hopefully and give back into our economic of our county and the socioeconomics of our county so that's my pitch and i'm just hoping that these six and uh, are going to be successful and then the snowball is going to start happening you're all just beginning i see great things in the future for all of you um Kelly, Flamia, and Accenture. With Accenture, thanks so much for participating. Uh, I'm in DC, so maybe I'll pay a visit to your DC program one of these times. Uh, David at St. John's in Montana, really interesting healthcare model, um, something for you folks to take a look at. Pam, really good example of kind of public partnerships and public and private and workforce and community college partnerships and schools. So really interesting. And then Justin, you can't do this work without leadership councils such as you represent, really key so thrilled to see that you guys are involved in it uh and you know across the country you'll see chambers solely getting involved in other business organizations and trade associations very important part of it so whether it's registered or unregistered younger youth or older youth uh here are some four examples of some pretty interesting youth apprenticeship programs and i know i'm way over uh so i'm going to turn it back to my friends at new america panel thank you so much for your time today really appreciate it